This brings me to a question that we, we touched on briefly in our earlier conversation of, 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 of the LBGT community winning its rights, what, having, having been a little more successful, temporarily anyway, in winning its rights in, the, what, in two generations, three generations, which is really pretty fast um, compared to some other communities that, you know, can't get a handle on the vandal. Um, why do you think that is? Why? Well, you know, every um, social movement moves at a slightly different pace, and yet there are commonalities. Uh, the struggle for LGBT rights, while distinct from that of other communities, is also inextricably linked with mm -hmm. those. The struggle for women's rights, for the rights of people of color. Of course, uh, many LGBT people are either women and or people of color. Um, we have not achieved complete and full rights. Right now, there are only 19 states in the District of Columbia that explicitly protect people from discrimination based on gender identity and expression, as well as sexual orientation. Uh, we don't actually have a statutory right uh, at the state level here in New York. We have an executive order, but we don't actually have a statute enacted by the state legislature that prohibits discrimination based on gender identity or expression. And we've seen backtracking with the Trump administration's uh, announced ban on openly transgender uh, service people yes. serving in the military and rescinding Barack Obama's um, executive order and guidelines with regard to transgender discrimination in schools. So I think the fight goes on. I do think that we have made tremendous progress, as you say, if you think about the Stonewall uh, riots in mm -hmm. 1969, um, and here we are in 2017, and we've made enormous progress. Who in 1969 could have even envisioned um, same-sex marriage rights, and yet we now have marriage equality since the Windsor and Obergefell decisions? So we've made tremendous progress, but we have a long ways to go. And I think one of the things that we have to do as an LGBT community is think intersectionally about multiple oppressions. We have to think globally and internationally about how the LGBT community intersects with other communities and other struggles, one of these being Palestine, and uh, how it intersects with struggles such as struggle with regard to police accountability police harassment and police brutality. Um, mm -hmm. For one, there's been a long history of that directed against LGBT people of color, especially transgendered people and especially queer uh, people of color. And so um, when we look intersectionally and broadly at all these struggles, we see connections, we see relationships, and that's what we really need to do. Look at these relationships. Uh, we have to look at the economics of this, the role that money plays, frankly, in all this, and um, how money and power relate, and how the struggle for empowerment is only partly about the struggle for juridical rights. It's really about not only laws, but it's about changing hearts and minds, changing cultures, and changing societies. So this, this going back to this, the, the, the the great uh, and and long way to go uh, improvement that's happened in, in, in the rights community because all of these all of these fights seem to be you know smacks in the belly of the establishment uh, and the establishment you know reacting back and among those smacks are the smacks about how money moves around who makes a lot of money who doesn't make a lot of money and 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 the the um, so I'm I'm, I, I'm well you, you, certainly. African American people have made great strides. I mean, the the world has changed dramatically in my lifetime, uh, I, and I I live in New York, and I can New York has changed. Yes. That, you know, although it, it I I heard recently it has the most segregated school system in the in the United States. So it's changed, and it's not changed. Yes. Yes. Um, so so tell us something about the uh, the. The Cuomo blacklist on this. Uh, um. So last summer, Andrew Cuomo issued an executive order, essentially banning support for or advocacy for boycott, divestment, and sanctions (BDS) aimed at apartheid Israel. Now, uh, the governor's executive order actually kind of preempted legislation that was already moving forward 
the state senate had already passed a bill, but the assembly had not yet acted. And that's partly because Cuomo wanted credit for this, wanted sole credit for doing this, since he's planning his presidential run. Um, this blacklist is really McCarthyite. And here I'm referencing Joe, not Eugene. Mm -hmm. um, the blacklist essentially would be a list of all organizations in the state that publicly support BDS aimed at dismantling Israeli occupation and apartheid. But what's particularly McCarthyite about this is that they won't necessarily tell you if your name is on the list. Um, and if your organization's name is on the list, you have to prove that you do not, that the organization does not support BDS for them to take it off. Now this is clearly un unconstitutional. It's a total breach of the constitutional protections to freedom of speech. The US Supreme Court has already ruled on the issue of boycotts. And in a case involving the NAACP, found that boycotts are a protected form of political speech. So it's unconstitutional. Um, the ACLU and NYCLU certainly believe that it's unconstitutional. And uh, Palestine Legal and other organizations. And a number of different organizations formed a coalition called New York State Freedom to Boycott Coalition. We actually marched uh, from the Mount Kisco uh, MTA station, Metro North station, to uh, the governor's house um, in Mount Kisco uh, last, uh, last July uh, to protest this. Um, there's an even more insidious piece of legislation which is wending its way through Congress, which is called uh, the Israel Boycott Act, and it would criminalize support for BDS. Um, under its provisions, individuals could be sentenced to a 20-year prison sentence and up to a $1 million fine for publicly supporting BDS aimed at Israel. Now, this is clearly totally unconstitutional, um, but it's caused a certain flurry of activity, and Kirsten Gillibrand, the junior senator from the state of New York, just withdrew her support for the legislation. She had supported it before? Yes, she was one of the co-sponsors, and she considers, she considers herself a progressive, yes. And Chuck Schumer, the senior senator from New York, is one of the co-sponsors. I might add that nearly half the sponsors are Democrats, so it's both Democrats and Republicans. Ben Cardin is a leading uh, uh, sponsor, the lead sponsor, he's a Democrat from Maryland, and it would criminalize public support for BDS. What's the goal of, uh, uh, I mean, uh, you know, aside from the obvious goal, <laughs> what's the uh, less than obvious goal of, of number one, of, of, of criminalizing people for speaking, right. for supporting, it's, you know, is, is it just, it's, it's just going to move it on into other areas, it's just the first area, and, and why is, is this, just an easy for some like Cuomo or Gillibrand, if they're running for re-election, they want to be they want the support of those people, traditionalists, you know, in, in the Jewish camp, in the in the fundamentalist Christian camp, in the. I mean, I can't see any other reason for doing such a thing. Well, first of all, it's based on a false allegation of anti-Semitism against BDS. Uh, which is the false argument that somehow BDS singles out Jews as a class, which it doesn't. It's aimed at Israeli government policy, and a, a government policy that many Israeli Jews themselves actually object to. Mm -hmm. And there are Jewish organizations, including uh, Jewish Voice for Peace, and Jews say no. A doll in New York, which is predominantly Jewish, and even New York City queers against Israeli apartheid, which is majority Jewish, uh, who oppose such legislation and who oppose Israeli occupation and apartheid. So it's based on a false allegation of anti-Semitism, and in fact, because it assumes that all Jewish Americans support uh, Israel unqualifiedly, in itself, it is implicitly anti-Semitic, actually because, of course, many Jewish Americans oppose occupation and apartheid. Um, but it's, attempt, it's an attempt to chill speech and basically silence critics of Israeli occupation, apartheid, and genocide. Um, and uh, unfortunately, these, uh, these tactics often work. APAC, uh, the uh, America-Israel um, uh, 
Public uh, uh, Affairs Committee uh, based in Washington uh, has said that this uh, legislation is its primary uh, legislative uh, <laughs> goal uh, in uh, this year. And so uh, these tactics often do work. Uh, what's surprising to me, the only thing surprising to me is that Kirsten Gillibrand actually withdrew her support. This is the very first time that any member of Congress has actually withdrawn their support from pro-Israel legislation or anti-BDS legislation uh, that's been introduced into Congress. So that's the surprise, that's the surprise. But I think it's because there's such an outcry uh, in town hall meetings uh, from uh, her constituents, including uh, those who are members of Jewish Voice for Peace and other organizations, that and the fact that the ACLU told her directly, and they met with her and told her that the legislation was unconstitutional. Uh, it was an abridgment of uh, freedom of speech. And so to her credit, she did listen to them. Uh, I might add that she has, a, like so many other Democrats and Republicans, has a really terrible record when it comes to Israel-Palestine. She publicly uh, supported uh, the Israeli genocide in Gaza in 2014, as did Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton. So we have a lot of work to do. But the fact that Kirsten Gillibrand with, would withdraw her support for this legislation is a very interesting development, I think. And it shows those who support human rights for all in Israel-Palestine are actually making progress. It's, it, it seems to me like if, 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 if People were looking at this at like from 300 years from now or 400 years from now. The way that the, the population is dancing around these issues of racism and isms, you know, keeping one, you know, oh, oh, we 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 were good. We're not. You know, don't call us a racist or we we support we support uh, um, this group. Uh, as we're not paying attention to what they're doing to that group, but we, you know, the 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 clumsiness. Uh, of the of this of this this these 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 dances where so much is not said where so right. much is you know you don't mention you know it's anti-Semitic no it's not anti-Semitic right. and you know that you know that I know you know that you know I right. know you know that exactly. uh, and but you you refuse to you you refuse to cop to it you just you just put up this stupid these stupid things or 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 the bathroom thing right. that, that's come out with it. Uh, there was a wonderful thing on thing. Facebook where somebody said, bathroom, we've been using your bathrooms forever. <laughs> you know, what are you talking about? Bathrooms, this is so, um, I know it's like, it's like, it's like little kids with very little knowledge are running the show. Right. Um, well, you have to understand that the bathroom panic, the transgender bathroom panic is the last gasp of the religious rights objection to LGBT rights. They lost the battle over same-sex marriage. And you know the smarter strategists and tacticians uh, in the Christian right know that they've lost that battle. There's never going to be a constitutional amendment uh, to prohibit same-sex marriage. It's simply not going to happen. The country's moved on. Um, there's been a sea change in terms of American public opinion on that issue, which has moved faster than on any other social issue in U.S. history. Uh, so they lost that. So what do they have left? They have the bathroom panic. Now, if you look at HB2 in North Carolina, it's important to recognize that that legislation wasn't just about uh, prohibiting transgendered people from using the public restroom um, consistent with their gender identity and presentation. It was really about rolling back civil rights and human rights for a whole bunch of people in that state because what that legislation did was it repealed all local city and county uh, civil rights and human rights legislation in the state. In other words, the ability to pursue a discrimination complaint based on race, ethnicity, religion, disability, sexual orientation, and gender identity. Ah, so that's what they were getting. Yes. They were getting a whole... So the agenda was much broader than just attacking transgendered people. It was about attacking women, people of color, people with disabilities, et cetera, et cetera. Open, uh, HIV, people who are living with HIV AIDS. And um, that's the untold story. Same thing in Texas now, there's a, there's, a, there's a bathroom bill been introduced. 
what's important to recognize is that this legislation is not only unconstitutional, it's also unenforceable. It simply cannot work. And we could, if you're interested, I could go into details explaining why this legislation could never actually be enforced anyway. But uh, the broader agenda is rolling back civil rights and human rights, not only for transgendered people, LGBT people more generally, but for women and people of color and people with disabilities as well. I, I, that's certainly what it looks like. They, they, they've got their back up against the wall, and, and they're going to find ways to hold back the storm that's already there, you know, because yeah. it doesn't make any sense. What the, the, the well, it's completely nonsensical. They're using a legitimate issue, which is the issue of women's safety, but manipulating it uh, to scare the public um, into seeing a danger where there is none. Actually, if anything, the people who are most vulnerable to assault in public restrooms are actually transgender people. I'm sure. So uh, the legislation is totally misconceived. It's based on um, falsity and bigoted assumptions and prejudices. And as I say, the larger agenda is actually rolling back civil rights and human rights for everyone. <sighs> <laughs> Uh, we fight on. We fight on. We're, we're, we're coming to the, um, amazingly to the end of this discussion. We're going to have two discussions with, with Pauline. Uh, and so this is, uh, we, we're 20 seconds away from the end of this. So uh, in the next time, we're going to be talking more, uh, even more about how money moves around, which is uh, something I really want to know more about. So thank you very much, for Pauline, for joining us on The Facts. And... Uh, you know where we are, everybody, and good night.